Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, analyzing intrusions and intruders. Uh, a little bit more of a deeper psychological um, approach to network analysis uh, than uh, standard uh, practices today. <laughs> okay, so I'm here to discuss um, how to implement some you know, additional um, concepts into your current security program uh, that you may not use today or that you may not know that is available today or even where to go get this information and how you can better uh, increase your response times, your analysis of threats, and how to prevent them. Also discuss some research efforts that are underway to enhance some of the technologies I'm going to talk about today. And um, most, of, uh, most of you or who do incident response don't know when you have to make a phone call to law enforcement, like uh, FBI, Secret Service, when there has been an intrusion, what you make sure that all your ducks are in a row, make sure that you're prepared when, they, when you have to make that call, because they're going to look at you and go, hey, wh wh where's this information? And if you don't know what to give them, you're going to be you know, kind of at a loss. All right, so primarily the technologies that I, I do a lot of research with are honey pots and honey nets uh, for the past six years. That's been my primary uh, professional focus. Uh, two you know, main credos, know your enemy and know yourself, right? So if you don't know who your threats are, who your attacker is, how skilled they are, um, you, you're really fighting blind when it comes to defense. Um, and then knowing yourself, knowing your weak spots, knowing your val uh, the valuation of your assets, knowing what you know, you're know you really trying to protect in day-to-day -day business operations. Um, okay, so foundations for learning, uh, we need to, this whole topic, you, know, you get down to behavioral profiling, right? And it does have negative uh, connotations in uh, the, the public and the media, but that's what you get really down to when you start doing honey net and honey pot analysis of attackers or hackers on a box. Um, Assumptions of profiling, um, that the uh, intrusion reflects the personality of the attacker. Now, this isn't always true. Uh, the methods remain similar, which in our case, all things cyber, is not. Um, the signatures remain the same. It depends on what type of attacker you're uh, looking at. And the personality will never change. Well, we also know that that's not true. But this is how the, the law enforcement community, how they approach it. Um, I've done a lot of work consulting with companies and banks who do have to report this information to the FBI and Secret Service over the past several years. So this is where all this keys into. Um, the, the, the law enforcement organizations, they try to analyze the patterns of individuals and groups uh, based on you know, what they hit, how they hit it, what they were after, what they did when they uh, took a system down. And they focus on the behavior of that attack or individual. Um, the skills and abilities was the custom tools where they, you know, open tools that are new domain uh, widely known. Um, how long did the attack take to occur? How long was that entity in the system? Um, and the complexity of the attack, you know, did they know about the network? Did they seem to go right where they're, uh, you know, right to the system, right to what they're going after. They have to fudge around for months, weeks, days, whatever. Um, so if you go back to it, right, this is where it all started, and this is the whole um, thing with social science is trying to bring it in. Um, Jack the Ripper, right, so 1888, uh, they started profiling, the first widely used, uh, commonly known uh, use of uh, behavioral profiling in an uh, incident. Um, so what, what they were able to get together, put together, law enforcement types, was actually an MO of that attacker, right, Jack. So they had, you know, they put down the victims, which we can relate that to systems, the times of the attacks, the circumstances of the attack, what actually happened, how they got in, how they left that system touched, and you know, the mutation of what they did when they were on the system, what did they take, what did they alter. So you can relate all this domain knowledge to what we do in security, right? And if you're on the, if you're on the attacking side, well, this is how the incident response folks try to uh, look at this. Um, patterns and signals is what you try to get out of this, right? You try to look, okay, so... Is this one attack over here relevant to these other attacks here? They, they all look the same. Um, and how can I put that together when you know you, I'm trying to help a customer who's a financial institution put, figure out was this organized crime? Was this somebody just going out for some money? A uh, um, an angered employee, a disgruntled employee. So you know when the bless you uh, when the law enforcement types try to put together a profile, they try to figure out okay. What, what, what attributes, what observables that I see in this intrusion that I can put together and report and try to go put handcuffs on somebody? Well, they, they try to build a suspect list of who done it, right? And the same thing relates to Jack, the, you know, the royal plot. You know, some assumed he was a doctor. 
Um, and then they came out with uh, some other statements about Jack. I mean Jack. And then uh, see it's here the basic profile overall of Jack. This is what they came up with. So you know, even 200 years later, they still can't really figure out who he was. But they have all these assumptions about Jack. Now the uh, the FBI, Secret Service, and, and their official you know, papers that are out there, you can go Google. They say profiling is about 70, 75 percent accurate. So it doesn't work. And that's with serial murderers and habitual offenders. All things cyber, we can actually mask that a lot, much more uh, effectively than uh, somebody in the uh, uh, physical world. So when you're doing defense, um, you're not alone, right? You have over 100 years of experience that you can go to on the internet, uh, through academia, research, and go learn how to apply these other sciences to what you're doing today. So you know, there aren't tools widely available for this type of um, activity, but there are. There is research. There are people that you can email and talk to. There are books you can go buy and read. And it's key to understanding a threat. So you're doing defense on a network, and you're you know you see bots and you see worms, you see you know client side attacks, you see people trying to bang on your DMZ, you see you know phishing uh, emails, and all the stuff you have to fight with on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you don't really try to understand who it may be and what they're after, understanding that will help you defend much better. And the systems now are at a point where you know our security tools, they're basically down. Yeah, we have a lot of gaps to fill, and we're going to be filling them over the next several decades. However, they're at a point now where you can start taking all this minutia of looking at all this, you know, this huge haystack of data and add some other things to it that'll take all the, the, the heavy lifting off of your uh, shoulders and let you do the heavy thinking. So you have all these cross domains, right? Post-mortem analysis is what we always almost do. An attack occurs, we respond to it. But you're trying to get your business back up, your organization back up, your customer back up after you've been hit. So you're reeling from this pain trying to clean all this stuff up, but then you want to figure out who did it. And when you have to call the police or you have to call the Secret Service or whoever, you know, it, it makes it very hard to do so. So, but it is possible now to look at this and understand the who, how, and the why. Why they attacked me, who may have, have been, and uh, how they got in, right? Um, and, and the behavioral, pro, uh, behavioral profiling aspect of it, just simply giving you guys concepts and how you can relate this to, you know, the cyber world. Okay, so combining attack analysis intruder analysis, intrusion analysis with attacker profiling. There's a lot of research out there on the internet. Multiple uh, universities have a lot of research papers going on, a lot of research efforts. Uh, the HyNet Project is another one, open source organization. Um, you know, honeypots, they do they're a lot for real-time analysis. And you can uh, use this in calculating multiple attacks in your network and see if they are from the same entity, if they're from the same person or the same you know, crime organization. And applying these like social sciences, criminal sciences, computer sciences all together to make solutions or systems or processes in your, in your security program, it, it'll help out a lot. It really has for a lot of our customers that we do this to. So this is kind of our tree right here, computer science, social science, and criminal sciences. We have a few experts on our staff who and consultants that we work with that have done some work to build a, a lot of processes, forms, data flow, um, um, frameworks. But we're actually working on building some actual applications that you can put data in, and when you know on the other end you get it out, you get a nice little report of you know who done it. But why do you want to be this guy, right? So you're responding to an attack. You're going to pull your hair out, trying to figure out who did it. And it's really hard to do that when you're trying to get your uh, computer system back up. So you have all these things to worry about, right? You have the, the body of the crime. But you have all these things you have to take into consideration. Where do you go find your data? Where do you go look for what's been changed? Where do I get all the data sources to give me a clear picture? Most organizations, most of your leadership, they really don't care, right? They just want the things fixed. They want the things running and back status quo. They really don't care. They want that little checkbox. But this is a little, you know, too much information to deal with when you're trying to do all this. So and then you have to deal with this life cycle right here, right? So you go through this investigative life cycle. And you either end up in court giving some testimony for somebody, or you just you know build better protections next time on your network. And what it comes out with: you know, more money for your security program, less money if somebody gets fired. Um, one more thing: you have to deal with this too. 
how do you know what kind of investigation you're going to do? You know, when the FBI and the Secret Service they come knocking on your door after your boss calls them because, you know, you got nailed, what, what are you doing in your security, when you're uh, doing your incident response and your investigation, when they come up to you and say, hey, what do you have? How do you know what you just did was the right way, the right path of information to give them the clear picture so they can really go and get somebody? You know, you have your, uh, your qualitative and your uh, quantitative uh, analysis, inductive and deductive. There's a lot of research on there, you know, um, criminal justice, criminal science uh, websites to reference. Okay, so honey nets, honey pots. Any people here familiar with honey pots, honey nets? Okay, so networking machines designed to appeal to attackers. Yes, and in essence, they are machines that you can figure to be hacked. Whether they have some services that are running, a couple patches down, whether it you know you have them side by side from production data, you know there are a myriad of ways to configure them. But in essence, you want them to be hit. Um, and the, 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 the value lies in that's a really great way to have an early warning of an attacker um, that something's going to happen or something's starting to happen. Uh, you know, worms, bots, great way to find those. And there are a ton of tools uh, that you can use uh, that are currently available commercially and for free. Um, they don't have any production value, so you don't care if they get hit. You can always rebuild them and just throw them back off on the network. And um, you, you, you uh, can do a lot of work to make them look just as real as your, op, you know, your production systems, whether you know, same naming convention, use the same usernames, same baseline image. You know, so when somebody gets on that box, it looks just like a real box. Why are they useful? They help you understand your enemy, your threat. You know, the organized crime, whoever it may be, who want to break into your network and take your information, take your money, take your next paycheck, right? Through that, the, through that from out of your mouth, off the table. Um, to make you aware of the latest attack methods. So it's really cool. The last six years, I've got to deploy honeypots all around the world, and I've got to see several zero days come out before they hit out in the street. It, it's really interesting to be able to see this information and learn the methods and processes of hackers from all around the world, 30 different countries. And you get to see it. You know, whether there's some 16-year-old on the street or whether it's somebody much, much higher. But it's really cool to sit there and learn that information without them knowing it. Um, and they, they do cause, uh, you, they do provide you some time to learn and prepare for that attack. You see something going on, they're attacking your system, and you say, okay, I can put these little things in place, put these filters in while they're messing around with these you know, synthetic systems, right? And they deter, uh, deter attackers once they find out that there is a honeypot. And I'll talk about that later. Oh, sorry. <coughs> okay, so the advantages of honey nets, they collect a small amount of data. But that small subset of data goes very, very deep, right? So there's a lot of in-depth information that you can get from just that little narrow subset of data. Um, they, re they do reduce false positives. Um, like I stated, they catch new attacks. Um, they work, at, you know, you catch everything encrypted. So if somebody's SSH out of your box, somebody's doing any, uh, you know, any kind of secure tunnel, you can see everything going on inside that system. You will see keystroke for keystroke, and I'll, I'll go over some examples later. Uh, disadvantages, it does give you a limited set of view, like I stated. Um, you can only see what's going on in, inside that uh, honey net. However, you can take all your other data sources, firewalls, router logs, IDS, system host logs and kind of fuse them all together and that's some of the stuff that we've tried to help automate for our financial customers is how to take all these data sources, quickly grab them, put them together you know, as fast as you can and start looking at that data and trying to tie all the little pieces together. Right? Um, risk uh, mainly comes from high interaction systems. If you don't configure your honey net right, which I've seen several times, uh, they can use that honey pot since it's a you know, non-production asset, it's not really being watched all that much. They can use that to pivot off and attack another system, you know, in all, all they want. Um, so they have high interaction systems, which are full-blown honeypots, full-blown operating systems, applications, you know, services running, completely interactive. Low interaction systems like Nepenthes, um, HoneyD, are just uh, little uh, mod uh, modules that run uh, emulate IP ports and services. That's it. Um, so they really can't, you know, be interacted, you know, with that much besides some network scanning. Uh, they fool the botnets, the, the Trojan, uh, you know, scanners, um, s some scanners. Um, so this is a, uh, a screenshot of the the, the third Gen 3 Honeywall. Uh, this is Walleye. Uh, it was written by a man named Ed Bayless uh, with about a six pack of beer. 
over three days, but it was really good for what it does. Um, so what this is, is uh, this is an analysis view of an actual event. You can break down and see the process ID. This is data from a honeypot, right? So this is actually at the bottom. You can see the attacker right here in the keystrokes. And you can map that up with the IP address, the time. You can see what, uh, what directories they're going after, excuse me, and uh, what time of day. It gives you a lot of information about what they're going after, where the, what, what, excuse me, what they're doing. Okay, so here's another one. This is another window uh, related to the, the flow data that, that it captures. You can see the to from, the timestamps, packet sizes, does a little uh, passive OS fingerprinting. Um, you can see how many packets, how many flows per hour, per minute. Uh, you can see the snort, uh, snort and snorted line. Uh, this is a imp that signatures that are tripped on the right-hand side in red. So you can take all this you know, information and centralize it from one location and really quick look at all the data and say, okay, so start making patterns and signatures of an attacker. How does he scan? How will he or she scan? You know, what kind of um, signatures do they trip? Do they use any specific tools? Are they you know, favor one operating system over another? Um, uh, here's another one which is really good. Uh, you see in the bottom, it's the same view from the previous uh, uh, two slides ago. However, you see all these deletes. So how would that come in handy? So do I have a person who has a you know, severed finger or you know, uh, uh, you know, mutilated hand or something, you know, uh, you know, bad growth or always you know, hits you know, Q when they meant to hit, uh, hit W, always have to hit delete. Is that a pattern or a signature of an of individual? Could it be? You can do that. Um, Here's another, uh, this is another view within the Honeywall. Uh, this is basically process-related flow of an attacker on two different systems. They break into the system, and you see them kick off the commands off of each honeypot. But you can relate and see how they jump from one to the other and go through, right? So you can start attributing all of this. And where does this come in handy? You can see all the processes that this person kicks off. So the first thing they do is the IP config on the box. Do they always have a favor, a specific service? a specific set of processes that they kick off the first 10, 20 tons. And, and how can you build this into understanding of how educated, how sophisticated is your is the attacker? You know, are they messing around? Is this for fun? Um, is this just, you know, this is a very serious, you know, uh, um, um, mission for them. You know, are they here to rob this bank and walk away with millions of dollars you know, in a very in a short period of time? Um, the problems with Generation 3 honey nets, the honey pots right now, uh, it's open source, so they have too many hands in the cookie jar. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a, a dysfunctional group for many organizations around the world, actually. Uh, their tools aren't regularly supported, and um, you know, issues uh, keeping up with, with attack advances. So, you know, they came out with, what, the Gen 3 honey wall uh, three years ago, and they're just now, you know, they've been updating it slowly, once every several months. It doesn't come out that fast. Um, but it, it is a good tool. They just don't keep up with it as much as they uh, could. Um, Honeywall, um, the current development stopped, so anything that you guys get is probably from about six, eight months ago, and they don't foresee any new advances to it in the open source side. Um, it is very slow when you work with over 30 gigs of data. It uh, uses MySQL, and since you know the, the code for uh, Walleye was written, I mean, that written over a weekend, you know, you know, it's not very... Uh, um, robust and lots, lots of shortcomings. We actually found a bug in the code um, with just a simple permissions issue for viewing um, past data, um, anything like anything older than day. You know, only a root had you know uh, read privileges. So once the log rotated, you couldn't look at any other data because you're using a different user through the interface. That had been there for three years. Nobody addressed it until just a few weeks ago. I mean, this, that kind of stuff. Um, Sebec or Sebec um, is the the honeypot a white hat root kit that sits on a honeypot and analyzes the keystroke, captures that, and monitors the attacker activity on a machine. Uh, right now, it's too slow. Um, it, it does uh, the open source version is um, it, it actually sends out one keystroke for every packet, and after about a month of running it, uh, the box like creeps to a halt because it ke keeps eating up buffers as it goes. Uh, it's too noisy. Like I said, it does send out a packet for every keystroke. And it doesn't capture enough information about that that session of the attacker. It's good for the open source, but uh, more could be done with it. Um, okay, so here I'm going to go over some uh, session analysis, some of the honeypots that that we've actually captured, uh, that we've deployed, that I was able to use uh, on the financial side. Um, 
So, try to go over here. So you see here, and sorry this is so small, I, just, I have a lot to get on here. So the first thing the person does, IP config, try to ping an IP, uh, a web address to see you know if they can get out unfiltered. Start doing a net view on the domain, on the domain, on the local system. So then try to ping another system locally once they get some information from net view. So they're going through the domain itself. So digging through the box, you can see here that they've actually downloaded some tools. And this is what CBAC gives you into the mind of the attacker. So go a little bit down, trying to get some passwords here, get some usernames, see what's going on. Oh, they renamed the tool. So now I know where that tool is when I want to go look at it when I pull this honeypot and start doing some RE on the box, first engineering. So now you keep going down, you're watching them, you're watching them, you're watching them mess with some, uh, to do some uh, semantic attacks on, a, on the local client app. Keep going down a little more, see him download more tools. Now I know what tools he's downloading, right? So, okay, now I know what all the tools are, where they are, how they're using them. Go down again. Oh, okay, they're, they're running, find the passwords, going down a little bit more. Oh, now I just found out where they copied all their tools to. And these are these are systems outside the honey honey net. So now I know what production system just got nailed and knocked over, and that, that were uh, exploited by this uh, you know, attack on my system. Honeypot uh, capture two. This is actually one of ours that we set out in a research mode, and they did discover because it was uh, misconfigured. My fault. Uh, I'll take that one. Uh, but you see the tool use, and they actually found a cback.sys, which is you know what it it, it wasn't renamed the driver. So they found it and backed off lightly after that. Didn't really do anything else but some pings and some mess around. Um, you see, they messed around a little bit and tried to find some more drivers and see if we renamed it. Um, but yeah, nothing really good. But they had started off doing some pretty interesting things. They found that we were using a VMware machine as well. Um, see here. So this, you know, this kind of information is very handy when you're looking at an attacker. Like, what kind of switches do they like? when they're using Nmap. You know, so, so what do they favor? Right? And that's a good insight into somebody who's trying to break into your network or is broken in is trying to export, you know, um, you know, exploit the rest of your network. What are they going after? How smart are they? The, the, the tone that keeps going around in the network, in your mind. Okay, so here's another one. Uh, going down to the domain, it's messing around. This one isn't too savory either. The first one is the meatiest one. It's going through and you see the searching for documents files on, on your system, right? Going through pinging other systems on the network, trying to net use some other shares on the network outside the honey net. That's it. it. Gives you a lot of insight into who may be breaking into your network, right? Who you're trying to defend against. And this, I mean, I am all about trying to stop uh, you know, hackers from breaking into my customers, right? So this is what we, uh, we always recommend them. Deploy some of these on your networks. You'll find out who, who's doing it pretty fast. Okay, so analyzing the session behavior from a you know criminal social science perspective, was it sophisticated? Were they motivated, targeted, or opportunistic? Organized or disorganized? You know, how would you rate these? And this is how we prepare this framework for our customers after an incident or when they start seeing good data come into their honeypots. Was it automated or was it a live attack? They get a lot of insight, a lot of insight that you would never ever have in any way. Um, so you can analyze session behavior. Um, having a large data set com combined with this information will give you a lot. So it will tell you about the attacker, system locations, what are they looking for, what, where do they like to dump their tools. Is this person, because you know, it's common knowledge, they don't, you just don't use you know, System32 anymore, you dump it as many places as you can. So what do they favor? Some people have a specific favor you know, uh, repository for their tools and for their uh, back doors. System functionality. How well are they with the, we're in the U.S., so U.S. character cassette, you know? How well are they with the English language, with Windows commands? Are they Unix? Uh, they favor Linux and Unix environments? So that are they you know, kind of rusty on their code? Um, or when they're trying to use, put in a Windows command, if they put in a Unix command by accident, have to hit delete. So the, things like that, it can give you a lot folder and file locations, do they know exactly where to go, where you're storing your information, or do they have to dig around for a while and try to find out where your, you know, your files are? And do they know who is working in your network? 
and they know what roles they serve. So when they try to go after somebody's file share, do they know that's the manager of the bank? Do they know this, this is just a teller? This person works in the mail room? So it gives a lot of insight. Um, we talked about typos. You can build those into signatures. Uh, you know, either host-based or network-based signatures when, when you're looking at from an attacker or look for an attacker. Okay, so when you get down to it, you're trying to do attacker characterization. There's a lot of research on this topic as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of universities doing a lot of this. Uh, we worked with you know, George Mason, Purdue. Um, primary components of attacker characterization are events and threats, right? So what has occurred and then the motives. Um, characterizing the attack. Um, if session data isn't available, it's going to make it a lot harder because you don't have that insight into the mind of the attacker. Um, but you still can take all your other data sources and you try to use that and leverage that, that try to get an intent and a motive behind it. Okay. Um, these are common attacker types, and I'm sure everyone in the room has seen this several dozen times. I just had to put it out there. Um, we're actually building a, a tool um, that I'm going to talk about at the end that kind of does this and puts you know, roles or you know, uh, um, um, you know, types uh, to attackers as we see them go through the system. Um, main challenges in attacker and attack characterization. There's a lot of cost to it. Um, personnel, skilled talent, it's very hard to find people who specialize, who are not only you know, smart in the cyber world, but can take you know, the social criminal science aspect of it, kind of merge the, the sciences together. Um, you know, it's myself and a few other uh, people back at my shop that we do this for a living. We consult to you know, some law enforcement organizations and try to take training for these people to help you know, cross domain ourselves. Um, Technology, that's a huge, huge hurdle because you have to, all the other technology that you have to take care of, you have to deploy, you know, costs associated with that. And then the legal, you know, most lawyers working for banks or insurance companies or, you know, trading companies, they, they pucker up huge instead of talking about deploying a hackable system on the network. Okay, so you want to build an attacker profile, and this is for. When you build this profile, if you use some of this information, when you, your leadership, when they do call, you know, law enforcement and say, hey, there's been a break in, they're going to come ask you, say, hey, what information do you have? So if you can say, hey, you know, try to think about and look at the data from a different perspective, if you start putting the data down in this way, it'll help them in the long run. It, it'll, it'll help them, be, you'll be more prepared to, to kind of meet them in the middle instead of just, you know, giving them a whole bunch of data and letting them fly with it. Um, gender content analysis, if you look at the data, you know, what, um, do you think it's a man or a woman? You really can't do that from a cyber perspective, but they can, but, but this is primarily what, how they're going to approach it. This is what they're going to look for. So if you can try to fill this in as much as possible, it would help. We're also working for commercial organizations. You can do a lot of things that the law enforcement and the government types can't. You can go back on the internet and look up for people and look, you know, IRCs, blogs, hacker websites, hacker group websites. You can go find all this information. You can go try to you know, surf their IP address if that's a source IP and try to find out more about that person. If you can do some RE on the tool, find an email address or some username, Google it, which we've done before, and find out, oh, this, this guy right here left his name right in the file. Idiot, you know, it happens sometimes. That's why you always use a pseudonym <laughs> somewhere else. So the age, is this person using really old command structure or very new command structure, for like something like Vista, right? So, but are they more familiar with it? Do they use old command structure but don't know the, the switches, right, the options or the arguments? Race, ethnicity, you know, we deal with terrorists, you know, uh, terrorism, you know, you have a, uh, um, you know, down there with Venezuela, you have some problems down there with them, you know, illegal immigration, there's a whole bunch of, you know, ethnic uh, uh, issues in today, um, racial. So, but you can look for that, you know, when you go back and look on their websites, you know, are they Islamic extremists? Do they have a, you know, KKK, whatever, you know, white supremacist, you know. You can go find that information. Um, level of intelligence in schooling. How well do they know that they speak, you know? How well do they write? Um, do they publish information on them? Have they written papers? Have they released exploits? Do they, they put this information out there for everybody to see if you can track them back down to, you know, their source. Political affiliations. Again, just covered some of that. Physical and mental health. I know we've all seen the movie Swordfish, right? Yeah. 30 seconds and uh, all that money, right? Uh, but he had a gun to his head. That's completely plausible. Organized crime all the time. You know, you will do this for us or we'll kill your family. 
that you know is it that kind of you know pressure on that person to perform this task? How do you know? You don't. But you can see sometimes in, in an attack um, if it's done too hastily, a lot of mistakes are made. You can maybe infer that. So when you talk to law enforcement, they can maybe say, hey, you know, what, what do you think it was this? And you'd say, I don't know, maybe based on this criteria, I can give you a 50-50 shot. You know, and they're going to ask, ask you questions like that. Okay, so this is a typology um, of attackers. Like, um, so typology, if you're not familiar with the term, it's trying to put groups into a type based on what uh, is observed. So you have, um, you have sophisticated and unsophisticated attacks, right? Um, and you go up and it's a three-dimensional typology. Uh, gain recognition, avoid recognition. What are your attackers doing? Okay. Um, target specific or target of opportunity? It looks like it was well thought out and planned. Or did they just get on the box and mess around and, okay, well, cool. I, you know, I got a new advanced web server. I'll do some transactions going on in here. I some credit card information. It was very specific on what they did. Right? You can take the information and go, okay, generally the government guys have to deal with foreign intelligence services, nation states, all that stuff. Uh, or you can do, was it simple web defacement, right? Did they get on a, you know, the, the UNICEF website, they get some, on pe some pedophile's website and just take it down. Um, a new worm or virus, they definitely want to gain recognition, and they're normally highly sophisticated, right? Um, foreign intelligence services are also highly sophisticated, and they want to avoid recognition. Web defacements, of course, they want to the world to see, and you know, web defacement is not very sophisticated in a form of attack, not anymore. Then you have a new criminal element. They're unsophisticated because they're learning, and in today's you know, world, criminal elements, they're actually getting really sophisticated with what they're doing, but they also want to avoid recognition. So there's also these types that you can try to put attackers into. Um, so assessment packages, when you want to, when you kind of do an assessment uh, on an intrusion, you can do the initial triage. You, know, you can do a, you know, a case overview. Victimology, if, you know, if you're not familiar with victimology, uh, it's basically assessing the victim of the intrusion, looking at that server that was hacked and go, okay, so what was on that server? What was there that that person want, what they took? Um, which is looking at, at, at from, uh, uh, looking at the victim and figuring out why. Why did this happen? Um, the nature of the information targeted, you know, uh, victim system functionality, right? Um, the attack, the vulnerability, the exploit, disclosure history. Was this, you know, was this a new? Was it zero day? Was this known for six months and that box is unpatched? Um, MO, were the signatures, content patterns, what actually occurred of the attack, what did the attacker do? The tools used, were they simple, you know, tools? Were they, you know, domain uh, knowledge tools, but they were customized a little bit? Um, utilization of the access, so when they had access, were they in it very quick, out very quick? Um, did they stay on the system for a while? Did they load an IRC server? Did they, you know, set up camp for long periods of time before this was identified? Um, data transfer technique, and that's also, uh, you know, very important. How they get the data out? They just FTP it out, secure FTP, S, you know, SCP. What do they do? Zip it up, you know, mail it off through some send mail, and do it, you know, through that user's account out the network. You know, how they do it? You know, web, um, logging alteration, deletion techniques, did it cover the tracks? Did they even care to cover the tracks? Would they, you know, were they sophisticated enough to try it and mess it up? And that's how maybe you found them, which is what we actually ended up doing once. Um, so when, it, when you get down to it, attacker characterization, when you're looking at it, these are the primary uh, um, components of the uh, attacker profile. The motivation, uh, the objectives, uh, the timeliness of the attacker. Um, Resources, uh, risk tolerance, the skills and methods, the actions, uh, origination points, where the attack come from, from inside, from outside, um, the numbers involved in the attack, and the knowledge source. So this is all what law enforcement is going to come to you and say, hey, you know, you have any of this information, and you're going to have to help them figure this out. Um, so are there rooms for improvement, right? We, we, so we're setting up all these systems, and you know, we're just putting them out there. We're hoping they work. Um, what can we do uh, to, to enhance this, you know, all this technology? Um, Bayesian systems, neural networks, genetic algorithms, heuristics, deterministics, and LCSs, right? Um, we've had the best, uh, uh, the best success with genetic uh, learning classifier systems, heuristics, and deterministics. There have been a lot of good work done on Bayesian systems and neural networks. We, we just focus on it from a different perspective. Um, 
How can I help you? <laughs> High speed processing. It can sift through a lot of data really, really quick. Um, you can, it can analyze a lot more than humans. Identify patterns much better than humans uh, at, at faster speed. Yeah, you can't. It's not a, you know, no you know, no human on the keyboard, but it helps out a lot. And uh, the challenges, the cost, development. You normally have PhDs writing these algorithms, so most companies can't afford it uh, unless you package it up into a nice little application that you sell commercially. Um, the data, the development, you know, to get the data there. The training or the users on how to use the system. Long-term storage, because AI is only successful with large data sets. And trust, you know, you worry about bu building the next Skynet and decision making. Most of the, the well, executives that we've had to deal with were saying, hey, we want to put this AI engine on your network and just let it sift and, and uh, watch data and see what happens. They're like, you're putting what on my system? How do I know inside that black box if it's going to work or not? Um, so, the Honeywell Plus Plus is just our recommendations on some of the research that we're doing to um, enhance uh, the Honeywell, um, increase speeds, increase database configurations, enhance analysis, and distribution for scalability. That's currently not available, and there's some major weak points of the open source group to, to uh, you know, to make it really uh, operation uh, user friendly. Um, CBEC Plus Plus, uh, right now we're looking at uh, actually doing some enhancements to it. Um, extending the host uh, capture capability, you know, actually taking from the honeypot the files. Every time an attacker loads a file on the box to ship it off to the honey wall, every time it hit tools in memory, like interpreter, you know, Sam Juicer sitting there in memory, take that tool off and ship it to the honey wall. Uh, th that's really hard right now. We we'll probably won't have that done. Uh, that's some advanced research stuff that we're doing, but this stuff, that's easy. Um, enhanced stealth uh, of our capture tool. So, you know, rootkit revealer um, says FU unhook. Uh, unhook FU, um, F secures uh, blacklight, actually making yourself hideable from all of those tools because you know attackers are using those on a box. They get on the box, run some of these tools. What security tools are running on this box? Um, extend the data what's collected and your know, register changes. The open source CBEC doesn't do that. Enhance process thread monitoring for DLL process injection, thread, you know, thread splitting. Um, this is what we're working on right now. Um, we'll actually have a demo. I'll, I'll come here next year, invited, and we'll actually give you a demo of the tool. Um, so an AI-based uh, engine that automatically analyzes the uh, uh, observations of an attack. You put a bunch of data in, firewall, router, um, you know, IDS logs. Um, you put the hunting net data in, put the TCAP in, and it'll chew on it for a couple of days to give you a report of what the, uh, with, you know, 50 70 percent confidence, uh, confidence rating of an attacker. The more data it has, the better it'll be. Um, yeah, it's not 100 percent reliable, but you know, a human, you can't ever take a human out of the loop. There has to be a human sitting there watching, you know, observing, orienting what the data is doing, deciding and acting. Um, you can uh, see we can implement using a learning classifier system a lot of modules from other sciences, right? Social sciences, uh, psychology, uh, criminal sciences, and computer science, right? And we can take all these different, you know, attacker types, characterization types that I just discussed, and the profiling methods, and apply that into an engine that can a lot of if-thens very, very fast. Look through a lot of data sets really quick. And, and what would that do? That would help increase your response times uh, to, your, you know, to understand your, uh, the attacker. Oh, sorry, again. Um, resources, honeynet.org, lots of good tools, lots of good resources, uh, Crime Library, um, Dartmouth University, um, Wikipedia has a bunch of links that will sever off from there, um, publications, uh, cyber adversary characterization, and some other profiling books for actually real habitual offenders, physical crimes, and, um, ph um, pardon me, physical, uh, you know, resources. Talk to academics, I mean, you know, to this community, you may not want to walk up to a police officer or FBI agent and say, hey, you know, hey, can I ask some questions about hacking? But there's a lot of academics out there who do that. Um, and if I didn't know, the FBI, um, they actually asked me to do it last year, but they're doing a, an open request, I guess, to, to get like a 250 questionnaire to kind of get a baseline for uh, cybercrime uh, offenders, if you're interested. I know you can uh, email some of the guys at the FBI about that. Um, but yeah, and they'll be happy to talk with you about all this you know, behavioral analysis stuff. Um, conclusion, so attempting to better understand attacks and how they occur, it just increases your network awareness of what's going on. 
uh, what your network needs. Um, studying non-cyber based uh, con uh, case studies. Look, you know, we just don't have to focus on the cyber, right? There's other sciences out there that you can really benefit what you do as a you know, defender. Developing better automation systems. And there's a lot of gaps. Uh, you know, I think Bruce is going to talk you know, about a lot of that tonight. But there are a lot of gaps in our net, in our you know, tools that we have uh, that are currently available. Um, and there are efforts underway. I mean, the Honey Net project is like realigning itself to do some bigger and better things in the next few years. And um, yeah, law enforcement they come knock on your door. You want to be prepared, right? You want to be able to help them out and get your company back on track. There you go. Have to put the famous dead guy quotes in every time I talk. So. Good. Questions? Oh, yeah. If you email me, I'll email you a PDF of this. No questions? What do you mean? How much? I mean, how much? Mm -hmm. It depends on what. Okay, so it depends on where you put it. If you put it on a DMZ, it, it'll start really getting hit. Uh, within a few minutes, maybe to an hour, but it really starts to get really significant traffic in about two weeks once it gets into the botnet, you know, scanners and the virus. You know, there's like, you know, repos out there of, hey, this IP is open, let's go nail it. You know, when we set up uh, you know, SMTP relay servers all the time, we set up, you know, these web, you know innocuous web servers, um, it, they get hit pretty quick. Um, inside the network, we're normally, generally responding to an attack, so we'll put a honeypot or honey net in for, a, you know, a, a customer after they've been hit to see if there's anything else low and slow running around their network that they didn't clean up, that they don't, they haven't seen. Um, and we also put that as a future preventative measure. Um, so that really has a low subset of data, especially because it's like emulating a user workstation or a server. Yeah, so it, it's not a lot. But on the DMZs and the boundary systems, uh, it's a lot of data. And you, you want to clean it about once every three months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, you can. If you do it, if you set it up, uh, if you set it up correctly, the PCAP of that data, you, you can set it all. Especially when they send the, the keystroke data to the Honeywall. If you just take that and you haven't touched it, if you just let that system sit there and it, it's coordinated across an, an intrusion with other systems in your network, you can use that data. You can give it to the bureau or the Secret Service and let them. They'll go run with it and they'll take it to court. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I have to email you a link, but there's this huge book about how to take, you know, for evidence collection. I mean, I, yeah, but yeah, there's a big, huge manual. It's like a 300-page manual. It's massive. Um, that uh, I what, what government agency put it out. Um, there's some like law enforcement uh, organization that's, you know, like a like a. Uh, it's like a law enforcement study group or whatever who, who does it, uh, and they put out this manual on how to collect digital evidence, digital, digital forensics co evidence collection. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, I don't remember the title offhand. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, there, there are actually a lot of companies now who are starting that. So there's a company called uh, Endeavor. Um, you know, not plugging anybody, uh, but they actually sell like an early warning system that you just put, you know, on your network, and they get all these, give you all these signatures. Um, they have a signature service, like a little early warning detection system, and they'll let you know. And they'll also uh, they can put it inside or outside your network. Um, we generally just try to respond to our customers' attacks, but they actually have like a service, an annual service they throw out there. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, you can like pump HoneyNet data to ArcSight, you know, to Sims, things like that. You know, you know, HP OpenView, any kind of Sim that you want to use, you can dump the HoneyPot data to, like using the standard Syslog server. Just, just dump it out. You know, any kind of remote messaging system. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I know a few knocks. Uh, you know, in uh, Minnesota and Illinois, that in Indiana, that that use uh, Honeypot data, and they just pump it directly to, uh, you know, an ArcSight type system. Oh, oh, sorry, dude. There, uh, S. Bodmer at Sabatech. You know, I, I actually work, uh, we have two of the founders of the Honeynet project on staff, like my CEO is the, one of the founders of the project, so. There you go. Cool. Anything, any other questions? Sweet.